you know, I grew up and I watched my mom make space for her art. I watched her, like, she put us out of one bedroom and we all ended up staying in, like, have, there's five of us in two different bedrooms and she took that one extra bedroom and she made herself a sewing room mm -hmm. and she could close the door and we weren't allowed to go in there and we weren't allowed to touch things and I understand what that means now mm -hmm. to be a woman with five children in Los Angeles and to say that for me to be present, to be whole, um, and to not be insane at all. Like, I have to have this space and do this work. Uh, so that's a, an enormous lesson that my mother showed me just by doing what, it, what she had to do to keep herself whole. There's a picture of me in the LA Times when I was like five or six years old holding a sign that says US out of El Salvador. So between my mother raising us to actually contend with the world, you know, to like, to um, make a mark and to have a voice in the world. But then also one of the things that my mother would do is um, in the summer times to keep us safe, she would just cover the dining room table with art supplies mm -hmm. and she would tell us to make stuff and so if, there, if we wanted we could make books and we would make clothes and we'd make toys and so she raised us to be creative and brave mm -hmm. and that's an enormous influence because she gave us the power to not sort of externalize our humanity and just look outside of ourselves for who we were gonna be and how we were gonna make it. She gave us the tools to both see how to make it ourselves and see how to make new places for ourselves to be. So. She didn't say just draw or just paint or just make clothes. She said all of these options are available to you. These are tools that you can use to express yourself. These are tools that you can use to make the clothes that you're going to wear to school on Thursday. Use them. So there's great power then in her, my mother giving us permission to do whatever we needed to do to get to that sort of next creative place and that's it's sort of like gritty it's sort of this way of being like I can make it I can put it together I can do that which is totally my process now it's sort of I have this idea up here like in my imagination and then like little by little I trickle it down to the tools that I have to the materials that I have and I think I could do that and then what happens is somebody else sees it and they say oh did you do this this and this and I'm like none of that none of that happened I just did whatever it took um, but there's a part of my process that is also just, uh, like I said, is like an act of really deep listening. Mm -hmm. It's like paying very close attention to like the frequency of my soul. Mm -hmm. Like part of my process I just call um, using this technology of my soul, the technology of soul. So it's like deep listening and silence and faith, mm -hmm. things that are sort of hard to, you know, to put language to, but you you know, that I've like really turned the volume up on parts of like these invisible parts of myself. And so part of the process is mining material and knowing that when I'm out in the world, if it's like trash day and I see a table and I want the legs that I have to get out of the car and do it because if I don't, then tomorrow it's gonna be like, oh, you really needed those legs to get to this next part of your process. And so part of it is mining materials from the world and it's, um, also having the courage to not lie to myself and to not think I just need to make pretty things or cute things or things that will make people happy and things that will sell and just like really to, because I also really believe in the power, I believe in the power of art, you know, and I believe in the power of love. And so if I believe in those things and it's not just like a bumper sticker, it's not something I'm just saying because it sounds hopeful, but if I believe in something and I have a living belief in art and in love, then I'm going to allow that art and that love to do the things that need to be done. I don't think conscious thoughts very much before I start making work. You know, I I'm, know that for all my life I've loved the landscape and um, wanted to work from it. And only later, after doing it for a while, I started to wonder why that was so. So my work is not what I would think of as expressionistic. 
it's a more kind of noting the sensibilities of different things. And in, in the ink drawings that I've done most recently, I rely on texture and tone. And I think texture is, texture is a primal experience. I think texture comes before just about any other sense that a baby develops. And, and it's skin on skin is, is their kind of the first recognition of safety and, and uh, familiarity. Um, and I think that, that comes through in visual art as well. You almost, in, if the textures are, are strong, uh, you have a kind of a tactile sense of what is there, even though you're not touching it. It's funny, in some of the new pieces I'm doing right now, I, I'm actually referring in the landscape to the long view, which I used to paint a great deal of. A few of the cylinders have distant views across fields in one section and then uh, up close tangles of trees and branches and stuff in, in another section of the same cylinder, mm -hmm. which I have not done very much in recent painting. I usually just go into the woods and take all the mess that's there and try to make some order of it. And I'm interested in, in that tangle and how it's, it's kind of a metaphor for our lives. The visual world is very interesting to me. I just will always be drawn to it, mm -hmm. and and the landscape in particular. Yeah. Say, somebody remarked to me that landscape painting is the only kind of art that isn't political, and I I don't know. I don't think I don't think it's not political. Actually, you know, I think <laughs> I have my point of view and and it is part of our way of thinking as as a group as a society you know it's and how I, what i bring to the landscape can't help but be political one way or another whether i like it or not the landscape is a never ending situation and everything is interrelated everything's alive everything's interdependent and that in itself is so reassuring and and interesting because there are patterns and, and then there's chaos and there's a lot of order and then there's total destruction and it's all there. Well, I met both of them at Pilchuck Glass School. Yeah, we all met at the Emerging Artist in Residence uh, program. But that's where we formed, was at the Emerging Artist yeah. in Residence program. 2014. So in 2014. Abram was the coordinator, David was a resident, and I was working at Pilchuck as the registrar. Yeah, yeah we were just uh, spending the evenings together just chatting about random things. And then I think it's because I'm a soft talker, or Liesl, we're soft talkers, so I misunderstand Liesl a lot at that time. <laughs> so I would always ask her if she what she meant. And so it turned into a word game. We're playing word games, and it kind of stumbled upon a random, what we figured was a band name. Flock the Optic. Flock the Optic. I think the name Flock the Optic provided a premise for us that was tight enough that we have the boundaries of the words of flocking, flock of birds optical illusion, just vision in general. And then once we got into the birds, snow geese migrate through the Skagit Valley every year, and that's the bird that we sort of latched on to. We went out on field trips, we filmed the flock, we uh, did sound recording out there, took video and pictures, and um, that is was a really inspirational thing for us, and that's sort of a symbol that we've latched on to, along with um, all these other things. I think that actually also reveals something a little bit maybe about our personalities or how we work together is, is if one of us gets really excited about an idea like we're, we, we're on board. You know, sometimes we might, the nuts and bolts of the thing, you know, it's, it can be difficult when, um, when it comes down to that, but the grander ideas, enjoy the way that plays out where somebody comes up with something and 
um, usually it's it's just obvious to all of us, and we're just all on board. And I think we really do all bring a really different way of working and really different skill set to the group as well that kind of rounds out each other really nicely. It takes like an enormous amount of flexibility to work collaboratively and I think that we all push each other and sometimes you suggest something and feel really strongly about it and you really still have to like back down and listen to the other people and understand that there's a fluidity to the ideas here and that having started the group kind of absurdly lets us be absurd in our decision making too and, and let things go a lot easier. I think that gets back to the essence of the project, you know, speaking about the fact that it's a flock and maybe relating that flock to the nature of, you know, the specific craft of glass working. You know, you belong to this pretty tight-knit community that exists all around the world and occasionally you all gather together in one spot. Which really mirrors the birds, like the way those birds interact. The place I used to live outside Pilchuck, the geese would come and land in the backyard of. They all come together, they like spread out, find different like feeding territory and stuff, but if they interact with each other, they like form a group again. I think that's like a nice parallel. That's something we've talked a, lo a lot about is the glass community and the parallels of um, the migrating bird population to the glass community and really that if there's one sort of goose on its own, it will be like collected back into the flock and supported by it, and that's something we've really felt. And part of uh, the project here it extends from our other ideas of wanting to engage the community, get them more involved in art, and make it approachable. It's playful, it's not so serious, it doesn't have to be in a vitrine or a locked case. You can get kind of close to it, play with it. And that's, that's great, catches them off guard, because then they feel more comfortable you know, playing with the zoetrope or playing with the birds and dancing in the studio when normally they wouldn't dance. I think Whedon is such a perfect place for us to, to come together and work on a project too, because we often utilize what's available to us, or at least are influenced by what's available to us, and we'll sort of latch on to materials that are around, or any sort of excess, this space in particular has, I mean it's massive, the campus is massive and has the, like so much potential for us to work with, um, but also just the material resource here and the, the feeling here that material, like all material has potential is really powerful and makes a lot of sense for us to, to work with. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we. <laughs> we uh, over Tom. 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 Around Christmas time one year, my mother wanted us to make Christmas treetop angels, and um, with this preformed head and sort of preformed body that you embellish. Uh, and I didn't feel like doing that, and it wasn't something that um, I sort of knew to push back against mm -hmm. the sort of prefabricated like shape and things, but I wanted to make something that I felt. Mm -hmm. And so I just formed, I took a little bit of self-hardening clay and I formed it over my thumb and outside of my mother's studio there were all these barn nails and I picked them up and I stuck them in for hair and I, I strung like in like 10 inches of seed beads for each eye and I made the figure weep mm -hmm. and I you know carefully like hand stitch, stitched this certain type of fabric my mother was a fiber artist and I stitched it and I made this figure my sisters were like that is not what we were supposed to make and I said but I was able to make how I felt I was able to take something from inside of me and to make it physical and a historian, an expert in pre-colonial African history, walked by that figure at like some summer arts fair, and they said, oh, you're doing that thing that they do in the Congo, and I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, and they sort of looked at me and they said, yes, you do, you should look it up, and so I then did, um, you know, a little like research on like Congo figures, and then I found that there's this long history of human beings who are tasked with making 
figures that have the power to do some specific need depending on the person who is besieging the figure. Mm -hmm. And then I also found out that most of the captives who were brought to North America as slaves only came from two places. They mm -hmm. came from the Congo and they came from Sierra Leone. So I found out a couple of things. One, that I can have faith in trusting my instincts, that I can just have faith that if I want to do something with my hands, that it's good. Mm -hmm. That's simple. And it's important because other people have sort of ideas to do things and they don't do them. They think, oh, that's stupid, that's this or whatever. But it also led me to this other idea that is just the question, like, what else is inside of me? Like, what remains in my body and a part of my sort of living system that is ancient? And how can I find out what that is? How can I mine that? So the power figure, um, I think, is a way that I'm able to like mine part of my own soul and I can mine some of the oldest and the most innate parts of myself and can use the figure in a couple of different ways. One, to contend with the world around me and then also to contend with the world within me. So I have the power, I take on and I embrace um, my agency as an artist to literally create power figures that do real, tangible, and intangible things. The things that I'm doing, I'm, I'm kind of putting together arrangements of stuff and then seeing what will happen. So you kind of like set this up and then just kind of push it off a cliff and see whatever forms. And ideally what it forms is kind of beautiful on its own. And it's that way because of the physics and the process involved rather than because I'm trying to impose a particular form on it. I was originally a design student, primarily in wooden metal, a furniture maker, and I never really learned to blow glass. I don't have a lot of formal training in the material, all of my formal training is in is in other materials. That's kind of where I got my start and my prime knowledge base. And a lot of times when I am working with glass, I'm applying those processes and those ways of thinking. A lot of times when I'm, even when I'm making art, I'm thinking in a very kind of design-oriented mode where there's a lot of problem solving, there's a lot of geometry and structure that I kind of play around with because that's where I'm comfortable with, where I'm most comfortable with. So glass is, is not, it's certainly not the only thing, but it definitely is the primary thing these days. Uh, and in large part that's because glass itself is it's a particularly interesting material, it's a particularly versatile material. It has a wide variety of behaviors and uses and uh, ways of looking at it, you know, it carries light, it can be structural, it can be decorative, all these different kind of avenues, you know, it's, it's around us all the time. Um, we use an enormous number of glass objects in kind of our everyday life and that, um, you know, from eyeglasses to light bulbs. And a lot of them are very functional and that gives you a very wide range of associations and just ways of working with it to play around with. And I just kind of never get bored. When you're working with it, you're almost always working with it in a state of transition. It's going from a liquid to a solid, it's going from hot to cold. It's going from 2D to 3D when you're inflating it. And those kind of moments of transition, those are the things that, that I like the best. And that's when it's really kind of magical and you're never sure what's going to happen. There's you know, anticipation and surprise uh, 